Hey, everybody. This is Jason Wilson with the Curious About Cannabis podcast. Thanks so much for tuning in once again. Uh, today, we wanted to do a follow-up uh, conversation and video stemming off of the conversation I had with Steve Albron with Confident Cannabis. Um, I'm here with uh, Brad Bogus from Confident Cannabis, and we wanted to do um, a review specifically about the Connect platform that we briefly talked about in the previous interview. Um, so I'm really excited. Uh, some of you might have seen a little video I did on YouTube, kind of a reaction video, because I hadn't really checked out uh, Connect before and uh, kind of kind of fumbled my way through it. I've got a variety of different questions and stuff, and um, I think this will this will be great all together with all this information together. It should give people plenty to to chew on to dive into Connect and and check out everything it has to offer. So thanks so much, Brad, for being willing to take the time, and I look forward to diving in. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Totally. So. Um, you know, and normally I'd, I'd be doing um, much more of the driving the conversation, but with this, um, you know, I'll do a little bit of talking at the front end, but then I'll kind of leave it up to you to um, kind of uh, steer the ship, so to speak. Sure. I guess the only thing I would ask to get us started is, can you briefly just um, kind of summarize um, what Connect is, and I guess also what it isn't, um, how the, the data gets fed into it, and then from there, we can go straight into um, a demo. Yeah, certainly. Um, so uh, prior to creating Connect, our company set out to solve the wholesale trading problem in cannabis. You probably heard Steve talk about this a bit. Um, to do that and create enough confidence and trust in the uh, information that was available online for uh, cannabis buyers, uh, specifically on the business to business side, we had to connect with laboratories. And so we created lab software where laboratories take all the data from their instrumentation and they pass it through our software so that they can deliver the results to all the different cannabis producers that have to get their product tested. And that gives us access to this data pipeline of trusted, verified, licensed, lab tested information. Um, that allows us to then build our wholesale marketplace in a trustworthy manner. But what it also gives us is access to this amazing data pipeline of chemistry. Yeah. So, uh, what Connect represents is a glimpse into that data, looking specifically at cannabis flower. And, um, and so basically, the, the biggest questions that exist in cannabis chemistry exist around cannabis flower. Uh, mm -hmm. Concentrates and edibles and tinctures can be made in a very consistent manner. You can dial in exactly what proportion of chemistry you want available in your product. Um, it's very easy to control. Cannabis flower is hard to predict. You don't know what you're going to get out of it based on whatever inputs you're putting into it, what mm -hmm. kind of lighting you're choosing, what kind of water schedule, what kind of soil, really what kind of soil. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> what you're and doing that's a there. complicated one by itself. Indeed, indeed. So, you know, the plant creates variable chemistry from harvest to harvest. It also creates variable chemistry within the very, sim like one similar plant. Like you pull right. a bud from the top, you pull a bud from the bottom. There's a little bit of variance there. So um, nobody knows how to predict what happens with cannabis flower. We, uh, looking at the latest science, obviously the uh, entourage effect is in constant uh, circulation and uh, we don't exactly know what the entourage effect itself is or, right. or what combination of what creates what effect. But what we do know, uh, what at least the science seems to indicate is that both cannabinoids and terpenes need to be considered as a bouquet uh, mm -hmm. to know really ultimately what an intended effect uh, will be. Um, these compounds all work in unison essentially. And so we took cannabis flower. We looked only at the cannabis flower that has been tested for both cannabinoids and terpenes. So we could get the fullest extent of its chemistry. Um, and, and we displayed that data into connect in a 3d environment. Yeah. And so what it represents is uh, sort of the chemical shape of the market, a, a place for people to explore the library of cannabis that exists, uh, chemistry that exists in the cannabis flower market learn about you know, uh, what is consistent, what is consistent about cannabis flower, um, maybe even shatter a few myths that they might yeah, have walked yeah. into with. Um, what it isn't is a product discovery tool. You're, you're not gonna be able to go find these products on a specific shelf in a specific location. Sure. Um, and, uh, and, and you can't buy cannabis off of this website. Uh, the only people who can really get involved in a transaction-ish sort of uh, relationship with this information are um, uh, can cannabis licensees whom are operating in Oregon, um, whom can actually find cannabis by chemistry within connect and go mm -hmm. to our wholesale platform and put in a request for that specific flower. But unless you're a licensed cannabis business, you don't really get access to that. So 
for right. consumers and for the, the, the broad public, this is really just a library of cannabis chemistry and flower. Cool. Yeah. Well, um, I really enjoyed the, the brief dive that I did into it, just um, seeing the data points that are there. And, um, you know, it's really cool initially seeing, um, you know, this massive THC rich cluster and then the relatively small CBD uh, mm -hmm. rich cluster. And I expect over time, we're going to see that that CBD cluster get bigger and bigger um, now no that doubt. there's now that there's more demand for that. So I'm I'm interested to follow this platform over the years. I think it'll mm -hmm. be really interesting, you know, to you know kind of capture on video and everything how it looks now. Because I think you know in five years from now, it those clusters will will probably look a little different. Yeah, you know, and talking about the shape, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so yeah, I can go show for you um, the the visual um, because the what you just brought up is a really interesting point. Um, since we've created Connect, which um, started as a project last year, the shape has already considerably changed. Um, in fact, the shape changes uh, quite a bit every time we get new lab information within. So as new tests are completed, new data is entering the system, and this shape actually will change based on that data. In fact, just in the last couple days, I can tell you these dots that are showing up here yeah. kind of out adrift between this big cluster. Yep and this main body, those weren't there uh, two weeks ago, I don't believe. Oh, wow. Yeah, so the, you know, there's, there's constantly new, new chemistry information uh, being added to the data set, and that changes this overall shape. And what I also think we'll see, uh, hopefully, is that this CBD cluster will start to attach itself to yes. the main body and not be so divergent from what you would expect most of the, the flower in the market to be, which is high THC, which is why this, this green color exists. Um, we have a little legend here that shows you, you know, sort of what to expect based on the color of the dot. Each of these dots represents cannabis flower, um, mm -hmm. you know, some of it private produced, some of it produced uh, on the national scale, meaning uh, private produced means there's a specific cultivator in a specific region producing a version of a strain mm -hmm. with their own specific chemistry. And then we have these national glimpses, the dots that are called composites that allow you to see you know, what to expect of a given strain based on all of the data across the nation, all of the gotcha. regions and all the okay. private growers. Um, but all of those dots represent a, a strain of flower or an instance of flower, and they're colored based on their cannabinoid class from mostly THC to, you know, sort of a, a, a balanced teal uh, color to this, mm -hmm. like, you know, more CBD dominant, uh, if not fully CBD pink. And then we've got this other cannabinoid class, which is THCV. And this is pretty interesting because we're seeing this more and more. Uh, mostly in Nevada, but um, we're going to start seeing additional sort of uh, tertiary uh, mm -hmm. cannabinoids show up in flour. So I, we happen to know a couple of producers who are producing CBG dominant flour. Yeah, Eventually maybe. that'll be its own dot color here. But for the most part, this is like how to understand what these dots are colored and what they represent. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention about the shape is that uh, the data science is, is basically evaluating 26 different chemical compounds for each of these instances of flower. Mm -hmm. So we've got about 3,000 or so dots in here. If you imagine a spreadsheet in your mind, 3,000 <laughs> rows deep and 26 columns over, right. uh, what we're trying to accomplish is which are the same and which are the, the most different. Yep. And so it's like 26 dimensional math. I'm not the person who does that math. I'm certainly not a data <laughs> scientist. But the uh, TLDR on that is the closer the dots are together, the more similar. The further apart they are, the more dissimilar. Yeah. And so, you know, dots that are clustered together over here are going to share almost identical properties uh, and they will be very divergent from dots that are clustered together over here, so on and so forth, which is why you see the CBD clustered together, right. um, you know, all by itself on an island and uh, why you see these interesting shapes developing. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's one of the interesting things about the chemical shape itself. It, it will change as we get more information. Uh, as more diversity enters the market, there will be like, you know, dots popping up in the ether between uh, sections mm -hmm. and dense clusters. And, um, and yeah, it's, a, it's, a re it's really interesting to see how that changes over time. I think in five years, you'll see a very different uh, cluster. Yeah, yeah, I'll have to make a follow-up video <laughs> and, <laughs> no and just display that. I think that'll be yeah, super interesting. It's almost like all of the space you see in the map right now is just like potential to fill in. Yeah, um, over yeah, time. that's one of the things that we think cannabis producers can really learn from this is you know, what, what is being overproduced essentially? Like what, right. if you look over here at the tip of what I like to call the terpenaline arm, yeah, uh, yeah. This, this section of the map essentially 
um, has cannabis strains that are really high in terpinaline. Um, and that's this uh, yellow um, uh, chemical up here, this terpene, terpinaline, generally yep. tends to smell like uh, pine salt. It mm -hmm. has like a pine lemon, but specifically chemical cleanser quality to it. You find it in Jack Herrera, you find it in Durban Poison, but you find it in a lot of things. And the fact of the matter is there's a lot of development of strains in this area. A lot of the hazes, the lemon strains, the, you know, the piney strains and the, the, the Jacks and the Durbans live here, but like not a whole lot lives in between. Yeah. And the stuff that's being produced on this side and the stuff that's being produced on this side leaves this space in the middle. That's like, what's going on in the middle? Maybe we can produce something super interesting. Yeah. So, um, you know, what we're seeing like Dutch Hawaiian, that's a really interesting strain um, that yes, it has some terpinaline in it, but it's actually got this giant amount of CBG. It's showing up for mm. it, uh, which I think is what's drawing the line in between these two things. Yeah. Um, this Buddha OG is going to be pretty similar, except, you know, uh, not really, there's not really terpinaline showing up here. So, you know, there's not really a type that lives in this space in between. And there's certain development that can occur here where people can create unique strains with unique experiences that not a whole lot of people are, are, are trying yet on the market. And that space exists in so many spots all over the, the, the map here. I mean, you can see right. that space exists here where, um, you know, there might be a, really unique quality of flavor or smell that you can create or a unique uh, outcome in, in therapy, for instance, you know? So yeah. Yeah. That's one of the interesting things about it. Um, uh, I, I, just to kind of explain what's happening whenever I click on one of these and you see these colors, um, the, this uh, data uh, visualization we call our imprint. And what the imprint shows you is the proportion of chemicals that exist in any given harvest or collection of harvests. Mm -hmm. So this cherry diesel, um, the, you know, th this is the strain that it's uh, tagged in under metric. So we're using metric with the seed to sale tracking software that all regulatory bodies in most states are requiring. That's confusing language. Not all, <laughs> but most mm -hmm. states are requiring uh, the use of metric. Some there are other tracking softwares that we use as well. But um, in Nevada, they use metric. And so the, this particular producer in Nevada produced cherry diesel. Um, and what we're seeing here is that the THC uh is you know a little high up on the medium high range of this axis so you know you don't really need to know what these values are uh in particular to understand what to get out of this um but i can tell you that the axis represents zero to the most that we see tested right so that gotcha. okay. that's like zero to 38 percent i think yeah um so what we're seeing here is that this cherry diesel is sort of in the mid high range of thc it's probably like a 20 to 25 percent maybe um, and that's what this green color represents the space, like the amount of color you see here, this kind of curve that's mm -hmm. being developed. What that means is that over multiple harvests and over multiple test results on this particular cherry diesel, they produced a bit of a range here. Um, not much. It's a small range. It's kind of tight. Right. Um, and what you're mostly going to expect is this reading here where it sticks out the furthest, which is on the lower mm -hmm. end of that range. Um, so that's what that, that color represents is like a variance in outcome. It's not gotcha. always going to be just one answer, but rather like, you know, cherry diesel by this Nevada producer has been tested eight times and eight times it has ranged between 20 and 25%, but it's really closer on the average to 21%. All of that information is being shown just in this little color blob. That makes sense. I was, that's what I was wondering when I, that's something I got a lot of questions about when I did my reaction videos. Um, uh, folks seem to understand that it had something to do with concentration, but didn't understand the the shapes. And I assumed it had something to do with a probability distribution or something yep. like that. Um, That's a great, it's the, it's the right assumption. That's exactly yeah. what it is. It's the probability distribution curve, right? So um, the further out it sticks from the axis is the higher probability for that reading. Yeah. And uh, the more vertical space that's covered in the color, the more variable the potential, right? So this person's pretty, or this uh, producer is pretty consistent on their THC amounts. I mean, this is not a very distributed curve. Yeah, yeah. Alternatively, you see the gray curve behind it, and that represents yep. what you should expect from cannabis nationwide generally. So the entire cannabis market produces this variability of curve in THC. And what we're seeing across the board is that this producer is producing just above average of THC for this cherry diesel. Gotcha. Okay. That was the other question. The main question I got was, 
what are the the shaded regions uh, mean behind the colors? So that, yep. that makes perfect sense. Okay. Yep. And what you notice if you just look at any of these inference, these shaded regions are always the same. Right. What you'll notice exactly. is that most people are producing about a middle amount of THC. Um, that's not really earth shattering. Mm -hmm. um, the amounts of limonene and myrcene are relatively consistent in many or if not all strains. Mm -hmm. um, that, uh, you know, alpha, beta, pinene, and humulene are around the same amount of concentrations across most strains, which is low. Yeah. And then uh, beta caryophylline slightly in between, uh, you know, the, the, the pinenes and, and myrcene in terms of the overall concentration you should expect. You see that CBG tends to show up in, in lots of strains. Um, yeah. That's also not surprising because yep. everything derives from it. Exactly, yeah. Yep, but what you see that is definitely not what you should expect in most strains are amounts of THCV or CBDV or CBN uh, or even CBD. So much statistical significance exists on the THC side and very little on any of the other cannabinoids. So anytime any of these other cannabinoids shows up, it creates a pretty different outcome. Yeah. Um, and that's what we're seeing here. We're also seeing that their trypanolene amount ranges a bit, but mm -hmm. uh, you have a pretty equal probability of getting any of those readings in terpenolene. Um, they have a linalool spike here that's higher than average, but not much higher than average and very consistent. Very consistent limonene and myrcene, which is about, you know, average to low average. A lot more beta caryophylline than those two, um, and, you know, a bit more than average. Um, and THCV is kind of showing up here along with CBG as a couple other cannabinoids. When you see here in the middle is uh, the sort of dominant terpene pie chart. So, oh, okay. uh, yeah, whatever terpenes are most dominant in a given strain will show up there in the middle. Um, this one is saying myrcene is the dominant strain here, or uh, the dominant terpene here. And while that doesn't actually look like it's true, it's really tiny little spike right here at the very top. You can uh, kind of almost see that there. Yeah, yeah, uh, now that you pointed out, yep. You see that? So, yep. uh, so that tiny little spike means there's probably been one lab test on this particular orange fruity stones out of Oregon. And that one lab test showed a very specific high amount of myrcene, and we don't have much more data. In fact, that's uh, you know kind of true if you look across all these terpenes. You have a very tiny little spike. Yep. That means we don't have a whole lot of data. Nobody is ever that consistent across multiple harvests. Gotcha. Okay. Yep. And that's funny. I didn't even notice that uh, the the uh, dominant terpene bit in the middle of the wheel. That I totally missed that on my first run. So I'm glad yeah. you pointed that out. That's cool. Yeah, it's cool. It's I mean, really, the thing is, is there's a lot of data science going on into the uh, these color distributions. The, there's uh, a lot of uh, scaling that has to occur to make these show mm -hmm. up together in a way that is still accurate, but at the same time, uh, visually significant. Yeah. Um, and, and, and ultimately, um, I, I'm not saying none of that matters, but I'm saying when you look at it, really you can get a visual sense just right off the bat of what you're looking at, right? Mm -hmm. Cleaner with a Q, never heard that straight. <laughs> but yeah, me neither. I'm looking at a composite, right? Which means that if I'm looking at cleaner, nationwide, I should expect relatively these amounts of things, right? Um, mm -hmm. What I can see here is it's like, you know, sort of lowish to mid THC, um, seems to have terpenolene dominance, right? Like there's going to be mm -hmm. more terpenolene than anything else because I can look at all the other things and yeah. they're lower than that thing, right? So you just get a visual sense of it real easily with the color. And then that color wheel in the middle helps to confirm what you're going to see is like the dominant smell when you go to try to find this thing, if you know what terpenolene smells like, <laughs> right? right? So, yeah. Um, so there's some gaps in knowledge, obviously, between what the average consumer and patient knows about cannabis chemistry and what we're showing here. And um, we can't yet take those consumers across that gap of knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, that gap of knowledge has to be crossed by educators and patient groups, yep, yeah. attenders, and you know, uh, reporters and writers and podcasters, right? So yep. um, to a certain extent, I recognize that terpenolene is not something most people are going to know what it is. But it's yeah, it's one of my my favorite terpenes. I I teach a series of workshops, and in those workshops, I usually bring out um, uh, isolated terpenes for people to smell and sort yeah. of cal calibrate their nose to. And um, it's fun when people are able to start picking those things out and can totally. tell the. The dominant terpenes, yeah, terpenolene, that, that turpentine kind of smell is, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, it, it sort of sounds like the word, right? That's where the yeah, words derive exactly. from. So it, some of these things are pretty descriptive. Limonene sounds like lemons, and uh, you should expect a citrus smell of it. It actually smells more like orange oil. Yep, but, exactly. Yep. <laughs> you know, uh, it, it, the thing is, it's funny, is that whenever I show any of our uh, my coworkers connect and try to make it make sense to them, I pull out all the terpenes, and I'm like, okay, this is terpenylene. That's this perfect, is yeah. This is beta pinene. Here's the difference between the two. Sometimes what's even fun to do is to find – a given imprint of a given strain and then collect all of those jars together and like waft your nose mm, over all of the open yeah. jars if you can capture the smell a little bit more yeah um, but you know it's it's a we don't usually have the full bouquet uh we only <laughs> right of course yeah a few of them yeah <laughs> there are yeah hundreds of terpenes uh, mm -hmm. that appear in the plant Yep. Yeah. So that's one thing that's pretty cool about this. Um, the uh, just a, a visual sense of what the proportion of chemicals are should give you a pretty good sense of what you're getting into. Um, luckily, I've been able to shop in Oregon for strains where the uh, dispensaries, the retail environments I walked into had this terpene information available. Um, they happen to be two of the most chemically, you know, forward thinking uh, dispensary retail environments I've been into. So um, they're the type of place where you can go and find, you know, specifically what combination of terpenes exist in any given flower strains because they might require their producers to get terpene tests and yeah. then they want, they want to give you that information so you know what you're getting into. And uh, it's really easy to then use this with a retail experience like that and buy cannabis. Yeah. The other thing I want to note is that Nevada um, as a state is the only regulatory environment where terpene testing is required. Uh, of all strains and all products. So if you mm -hmm. click to Nevada, you'll see the largest data set in, uh, in any oh, wow. state. And that's because every strain of cannabis that is tested in Nevada is tested for both cannabinoids and terpenes, which means that every jar of cannabis you buy as a consumer will tell you what the top, I think it's three or five terpenes are. So Nevada is a little bit more terpene educated as a consumer uh, you know, uh, audience because of yeah. the fact that regulatory environment requires that information be upfront. Yeah, exactly. When they when they launched their testing rules, I remember they were they were quite strict um, and influenced uh, California's rules that they've been mm -hmm. steadily trying to roll out. I think terpene testing is part of California's requirements. I don't know if it's still in the pipeline. I know they've had to stagger um, the rollout of the yeah. testing regulations. In their, California. their priorities have been kind of jerking them in a number of different directions yeah yeah well it's complicated and california is like a country unto itself you know as far as yeah. population and diversity goes so yeah we're um, getting ready to launch our wholesale marketplace in california and the way we have to think about california is like three or four states yeah exactly Northern california and central and southern california just totally different cannabis markets so you yeah yeah really treat them all the same uh, easily at least Exactly. And I, I remember all of the headaches uh, that we ran into in Oregon, you know, especially, you know, I'm coming out of a lab testing environment, all the headaches we ran into just with that, I can't imagine what uh, complexities exist in California, uh, yeah. just with how massive the market is uh, yeah. to get yeah, that no, all yeah. going. Yeah. Um, let's, uh, let's do some fun. Uh, what, yeah. What's a strain that you really like? Oh, gosh. Um, Let's just pick a random one. Search for koala. See if you find that. Koala. Okay. Yeah. No. It doesn't look oh. like, did I spell that correctly in terms of how the, the strain is? Yeah. 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 It's, it's not super common. Oh, so. I should tell you, uh, we don't have proprietary strains in here. Uh, the only strains that we have shown are in wide circulation. So there have to be at least, I think, seven or eight producers producing it across two or three states. I'm not sure what the specific data science parameters are in there, mm -hmm. but if it's not in wide trade, it's not being shown here to try to protect that, uh, you know, data privacy of what might be, you know, a strain grown only by one producer. Gotcha. Uh, oh, that's really, that's really interesting to point out. I'm sure something I, Steve and I briefly talked about, but, you know, something that I'm sure comes up is data privacy issues yeah, when yeah. it comes to um, sharing all of this data. I know it was something that when Confident Cannabis was getting onboarded, you know, several years ago um, in Oregon, um, that was something we we bumped into a lot. It took people a while to kind of feel comfortable uh, with what was yep. happening with that data. Yeah, and, and, and really, they should be skeptical. I mean, uh, yeah. after what we saw with Phylos, uh, Bioscience, you know, there sometimes what somebody says they're going to do to protect you actually ends up being quite the opposite, or at least the perception might be there, right? So right, right. we're very careful to be uh, protective of this data. This is why when you click on any given strain that's produced by a private producer, we're not telling you which farm produced this. 
Um, although the interesting thing about Oregon is a lot of the really smart buyers, they already know who's, yeah, yeah. who's or which, and they can tell by the chemistry. It's, they're very advanced in that regard. But, uh, but regardless, the, uh, it says Oregon private because that's someone else's information, right? Now, maybe in the near future, and we've heard, already heard this feedback, uh, people might want to opt in to showcase themselves here so that they can proudly declare, this mm. is my strain. This is my version yeah. of Mimosa. This is what I'm doing that's a little bit special. Um, and so we'll probably start to see producer names in here and sometime in the near future. But for right now, just trying to protect it. All these strains need to be in wide circulation for them to show up, um, which is probably why Koala doesn't show up. But, you know, let's, let's take a look at Mimosa. Yeah, yeah, you had that one pulled up. Already I noticed, um, similar to when I did my reaction video, you see a pretty wide yeah. distribution of that strain. That's right, uh, yep. Um, so Mimosa is interesting. It's a very popular strain. Um, it's one of the more popular strains in circulation right now, along with gelato and mm -hmm. some of the sherbets. Um, and, uh, you know, coincidentally does sort of all come from a similar genetic lineage, but really they've got marketable names. I mean, yeah, uh, yeah. right now, uh, you know, experience and flavor tend to win in the marketing game for a strain name. Yeah. Um, mimosa, it doesn't really have a specific expected taste or smell. And so therefore I don't think anybody really knows what the benchmark for mimosa is when they're, when they're building it. Right. And, uh, or growing it rather. <laughs> and so what we find is, you know, a mimosa here. And uh, what we see here is, you know, uh, what I would personally expect, a, a strong uh, citrus profile. Right. Um, it, this one happens to be a, a little bit spicy with the beta caryophylline. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, maybe a touch sour tart from the myrcene. Also, I would expect that. A lot of CBG all over the map. That's kind of <laughs> right. Nice. Yeah. It's also from Montana. And what Montana does is a little crazy too. Um, but this one here from California, kind of same deal, right? They're all mm -hmm. clustered here together. Yep. So th this is probably what I would personally expect from Mimosa. But if you go all the way across here and look at it, mm. you're not seeing an entirely different profile of flavor necessarily, but you're seeing a couple other things showing up that you're like, wait, what's that? Like this CBN spike over here. Mm -hmm. This also has a little bit of CBDV and a little bit of THCV that you can see here, yeah. right? A little um, more, a little more pinene. Yep. Yep. And a little bit more on the sour side. So yeah. you know, this mimosa is probably not going to match what I would probably expect going into it. Uh, same here, you know, pinene's high, mm. sour is high. What's this little guy doing over here? This is in Nevada. Really <laughs> the lemonine side. Yeah. Really dominant on the CBG side. L little speck of THCV, a little speck of CBDV. Not too unlike these over here uh, mm -hmm. in the corner, right? Yeah. So uh, what you see is though that like the specific proportions of these chemistries are, are, are all kind of different and based on how different they are, they might show up in this little section or they might show up in this little section, right? Yeah. And those sections are actually different chemistries. So the, to take away from this type of an exper of a experience is that strain name is not really the most uh, predictive indicator of chemistry, right? right. Um, yeah. Whether they're genetically certified or not, a strain name is how most people are buying cannabis. Um, and we can see that you can't really expect exactly the same thing. You can expect some similarities, but you can also expect a few differences across the board. If I go buy mimosa in California, or if I go buy mimosa in Oregon, I'm going to mm -hmm. have probably two very different mimosas. And really, if I buy a few mimosas out of Oregon, um, uh, let's see if we just look at Oregon mimosas, I might end up with this one here. Right. Right. And I might end up with this one here. Pretty different. Right. So yep. that's one thing that's a good takeaway from this is that like genetics and strain name, not a great predictor. Um, if you want to like actually um, um, uh, solve for genetic differences, for instance, mimosa being a really highly circulated strain, you might get an unscrupulous producer calling something mimosa that's not genetically certified as mimosa. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Just to make it more sellable. That's right. So we like to use Slimer as a really good example um, of how even when you solve for the genetics, you still see variants. So uh, Slimer is only available via certified genetic clone from one company. Um, mm, okay. When you see Slimer on the market, you can rest like 99.9% .9 assured that it is genetically Slimer. It can't really be called it. If it's not, you can't get it anywhere else. And nobody's really asking for Slimer in such a yeah. high demand that someone would call something Slimer that's not. It's not a very appetizing sounding strain name. Uh, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. So what you see is pretty uh, consistent expectation of outcome. But what's this guy doing over here? Right. This is right, someone in yeah. Oregon who's produced Slimer. 
and it's an extremely different outcome than this Slimer. Oh yeah, wow, look at that. In fact, almost all Slimer should have terpenaline in it. That's why they're all clustered here together. Yeah. Um, there's not gonna be any variance there. Terpenaline will definitely show up in Slimer if produced as consistently as everyone seems to produce it. But as you can see, you can produce it differently. I mean, yep. these are you know lighting inputs, these are water inputs, these are fertilizer inputs, it's soil, this mm -hmm. is climate, this is cure, this is so much that's going into what makes cannabis cannabis that um, you can't expect that you're always going to get the same reaction. Genetics might get you most of the way there, but they're not going to get you all the way there. And yeah, yeah. I mean, especially with terpenes, they're so fickle as far as, you know, cannabinoids are pretty genetically controlled and you can change affect the concentration through environment but That's terpenes right. you know they terpenes are a way that plants use to um you know really interact with their environment That's and right. communicate and other things and so they are very um they tend to be influenced by environment much um much more sensitively than, no than something like cannabinoids yeah i mean i've sat with a lot of uh, expert growers out of oregon talking about you know what generates the greatest terpene profile yeah. um and and all of them feel like they've got their own way of making sure they maximize terpenes yep. but the most consistent thing i hear across all of the different producers who know what they're doing and and know how to create really good quality terpy strains um they all say live soil mm, you know making yeah. a rich soil environment full of microbes rich with mm -hmm. nutrients that's not being added uh, by some sort of, you know, chemical fertilizer. Um, it's not, you know, there's not additional inputs other than making a, a, a curated living environment that you don't kill and you don't, you know, uh, uh, throw out and then yeah. start again. Um, and and that, that soil richness is what tends to generate higher terpene profiles. But I've also talked with outdoor growers who believe companion plants also are doing this. Um, there's a, a grower I talked to uh, in Mendocino County that uses uh, uh, fennel and mm, grows fennel yeah. in the rows between his outdoor plants because fennel is a very high terpene producing plant. And what he has found is that when a high terpene producing plant is next to a different high terpene producing plant, they actually both produce higher amounts of terpenes rather than taking resources from one another. Right. So it's not a zero sum game. It's actually more like a loud room, like the louder yeah. the people around you get, the louder you get. Well, and it definitely uh, terpene production can be a stress response, too. So that's right. If you're fertilizing a plant, um, it it doesn't necessarily need to produce a lot of terpenes mm -hmm. um, because it's being well taken care of to a point that, um, you know, if there's a lot of nitrogen and stuff, it just it just doesn't um, do that. But if you're allowing the plant to be a little stressed. Um, yep. so that it has to really kind of fight for survival a little bit and produce yeah, yeah. these these compounds um, then um, you tend to get better results i've had um, indoor growers uh, that you know tell me that the the timing of flushing nutrients and everything is really important for getting terpene boost towards the end of harvest and making yeah. sure to um, control your um, you know no matter what sort of um, feeding regimes you're doing, uh, synthetic fertilizers or compost teas or whatever, that you have to be careful yeah. towards the, the end of life because you actually want the plants to stress a little bit. Yeah, that, the same grower I talked to about the companion plants said uh, he had like a phrase for it. It was really kitschy, but it was something like you, you basically like make them struggle yeah, uh, yeah. Before, it, before you cut them. And, uh, and, and yeah, that, that's, it's, that's that response, right? Like, but it, it's again, it's an, un, it's an unpredictable sort of right exactly yeah unless you're growing the same genetics in the same exact living soil uh you know like harvest over harvest uh it's really hard to control for that and even still you're going to see variability yep. so yeah exactly so anyway that's that, that's kind of the cool thing i've learned about uh genetics and, and strain predictability um there's a couple other really cool ways you can kind of navigate uh the chemistry of the of the space and that is in regions uh, yeah i wanted to ask you about this exactly how how these regions get teased out yeah, yeah. So right now they're they're uh, they're not prescriptive. The we're not telling the system here's where we expect there to be a consistent reaction. What the data okay. science is doing, the algorithms are looking for the most statistically significant clusters of data and saying this is a region and the things that make everything in this space the same, you know, is this outcome here. Um, so the the data science is determining what these regions are and where they live based on that statistical clustering. 
Mm -hmm. um, it'll show you when you hover over here on the left side, these different region numbers, it'll show you the expected imprint of most of the dots that live within that region, um, sort of the expected chemistry of the region. You also can see um, the best known composites. Again, composites are like the national aggregate of a right. strain. So Big Smooth is both the best known and representative composite of this strain, uh, or, you know, of this region. Um, and uh, that information shows whenever that we have enough data there to uh, show it. You know, this region over here, super high in limonene, super high in beta caryophylline and linalool. Um, you know, no terpenaline, no THCB, uh, no real high pinenes, not really high in myrcene. So space bunk is the most representative. Sour dub is the best known. I guess that just means because it's the most consistently produced mm -hmm. within the cluster. Um, and what's really cool about these regions is um, you, you can explore within them, try a number of different strains within them to see if you're getting a consistent reaction to something and journal that, right? Mm -hmm. So as a yep. consumer using this, and this is how I've learned the, uh, cannabis chemistry prior to this library existing, was I would just buy a whole bunch of different types of strains from a given consistent producer mm -hmm. and I would just journal it, you know? Yep. Um, yeah. I've had a number of strains that all have this sort of similar quality to them. And whenever I have those, I have a bad reaction. I get panicked. I get anxious. Why is that? Uh, orange seems to be consistent across the board with those strains that geek me out. So does chemical, you know, the mm -hmm. gluey, diesel-y chemistry sort of, you know, that, that citrus chemical combination doesn't work well for me. I geek out. What it turns out is a lot of the strains that geek me out have terpenaline in common. You might think limonene, it's actually terpenaline. Yeah. You do well with some limonene dominant strains, as long as that terpenaline is not there to add that extra chemical edge to it which geeks me out too much. In fact, I think if there's one thing that is uh, sort of expected of terpenaline, it's that it's a bit of a racy uh, compound, that strains that are high in terpenaline tend to produce that quote unquote sativa outcome, the real racy outcome. Yeah. And if you go to uh, the regions that are super high in terpenaline, what you'll find is a lot of those, those strains, lemon haze, XJ13, yeah, yeah. Golden pineapple, right? None of these are like the strains that you expect to get couch locked on. Um, these are the strains that most people say keep them productive and uplifted and creative and going and whatever. But even well, this, that's not consistent and uh, predictable. Well, this um, brings up another question that I had for you. Um, yeah. What uh, correlations is this data set showing between what people are classifying as quote unquote indica and sativa mm -hmm. versus? Um, dominant terpenes is it yeah. as is it as inconsistent as strain names or is there some consistency there so this is actually my favorite thing about connect um it, you talk to people in the industry and you'll get a general consensus that most people think indica sativa doesn't mean anything right that it's actually kind of nonsense that like some sativas actually make me really really couch locked and some yep. sativas yep. make me geek out so if i get this range of feelings how come all cannabis is expected to live in a binary of upper or downer exactly yeah nonsense uh so one of the ways that you can actually explore that within connect is to click down here where it says cannabinoid Th this is a way to color the dots based on different information so we can kind of filter for different stuff right now we're filtered for cannabinoid class you can filter for indica sativa and what that does is it colors the sativa's red colors the indica's blue okay. we picked pretty divergent colors here so that you can really see yep. you know them stand out and all the hybrids are gray because they're hybrids right they kind of are all the same yeah um what you'll notice is that there's not a space within Connect where red exists and blue doesn't and vice versa. Right. Yeah, they're all over, all intermixed. Yeah. Exactly right. Um, and that's because indica sativa don't have any chemical meaning. They actually never have had any chemical meaning. I don't know yeah. why it got ascribed to it, but you know, it just it's the size of the plant. That's all it means. Sativa is yeah. tall and spindly, indica is big and bushy. They do have different chemical outcomes. So you can't really expect that that means something. Uh, but maybe really early on in the day of the land races, when uh, we were just now like learning about cannabis worldwide, and we saw that the cannabis in the Kush region was always sort of big and bushy, and the cannabis in the tropical regions was always tall and spindly, and they had different, you know, uh, feelings when you smoke them. And so maybe they're there for different chemical outcomes. It's all speculation, really. But the point is, is that what we've all suspected when, when we've been expect, inspecting this and having enough experience with cannabis is true, which is that indica sativa don't indicate chemical outcome. The one thing you can say chemically about indica sativa is that you'll see more sativas clustering here in the terpenaline region, mm -hmm. but that's not because sativa means terpenaline. Again, you see indica right. doing the same thing. Uh, what it does mean is that um, what people report as raciness is right. what considered sativa. 
and yeah. most of the raciness uh, exists in this terpenaline arm for the most part. Um, but when some people say, you know, uh, Indica's make them racy, look at this purple Urkel. It's got a lot of terpenaline compared to the market at large, but yeah. it's purple Urkel, right? So that should be, you know, the opposite of say a Durban poison. Um, it, and yet it's not. So, you know, Indica's can get you racy. Uh, sativa's can get you totally stoned. And, and what, what this Jack Herrera is doing way over here, couldn't <laughs> tell you, it's got no terpenaline in it. It's got this THCV <laughs> spike to it, which is interesting. Maybe THCV produces raciness, but we don't really know these things yet, you know? Right, yeah. The other filter that's pretty cool that you can do is production methods. So you can see- Oh, uh, wow. Yeah, you can see cannabis by whether it's grown in greenhouse, indoor, with light depth, with mixed lights, or with outdoor. Um, again, you're not going to really find a whole lot of consistency here in outcome. Um, a couple interesting things to note, maybe it's because of production method, maybe not, but the greenhouse tends to cluster in this region here, which is a pretty fruity region. Uh, mm. um, but you, you, again, you, you find greenhouse showing up everywhere else. Indoor obviously shows up everywhere else, but uh, interestingly, you don't find a lot of clustering of indoor around this space. Uh, you also don't find a lot of clustering of much around that space, right? So, yeah. um, you know, production method is not necessarily also going to indicate consistent outcomes. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just an interesting way to, to debunk some of these ideas that there is like a consistent expectation that you can get from just some of this information we have. Really, yeah. it's, about, it's about that full bouquet. It's about really looking at the overall outcome of this cannabis chemistry and saying, this is what sh I, I can expect as the, you know, proportion of chemicals. What it does to me is what it does to me. It's going to be different than what it does to you. It's going to be different than what yep. my wife gets out of a given strain. Like we report different feelings all the time. My brain chemistry matters. Um, I, you know, like I, I take cannabis the way an ADD person takes Ritalin. And so I need to slow down to be productive. Uh, if it speeds me up, I actually get more distracted. Yep. And um, that's different than my wife, whom when she uh, is able to consume racy strains is able to be much more productive. Um, it makes me scattered. So, you know, the fact that we all have different reactions to these things means this is a very personal experience that we need to identify, at least until we have enough human research to tell us this proportion equals this expected outcome in 95% of individuals. And the other 5% will expect these side effects. The same way we look at, you know, sort of uh, pharmaceuticals today, right? We will get enough human research eventually to be able to say this about this. But until then, sort of irresponsible to predict an effect for somebody. Yeah, exactly. And it, you touched on several things. And I know you got to go, so I'll make this quick. But um, you mentioned several things that, that I resonate really with. You talked about journaling. That's something I bring up repeatedly that I encourage for people to do um, mm -hmm. because of those differences. Because we're not just dealing with the chemistry of the plant, but also the chemistry of our bodies, like you mentioned. Right. And right now, there's not a good way to measure endocannabinoid system tone. I, I interviewed uh, Dr. Ethan Rousseau recently, and, and we yeah. talked about, about this concept of, you know, when's research going to get to that point? And, you know, we both acknowledge it's very interesting and exciting, and we want to see that happen, but it's still a long ways off because yeah. endocannabinoids are produced on demand, and they break down really fast. It's, and the concept of the endocannabinoid system is rapidly expanding and mm -hmm. overlaps with a lot of other physiological systems. So... Um, the whole idea of trying to find the best cannabis product for a certain medical condition or for a certain intended outcome um, is not as simple as just um, finding um, a, a, something based on the recommendation of a friend or a bud tender or something that That's right. is, you know, relying on their experience. You know, uh, the one last thing I want to leave your uh, viewers and, and listeners with is the idea of bookmarking. So if you're going to be journaling, one of the things you can do is uh, anytime you're looking at a given strain, like let's say this wedding crasher, you can click this little tag here, which bookmarks it. And then uh, the, the connect system will remember your IP address. You can go over here to the left on bookmarks and we see the wedding crasher here. It'll save your bookmarks for you. So if you wanted to try say blueberry biscuits, which is actually blueberry cookies, we had to change some of these names because of regulations. But uh, if you wanted to try purple Hindu Kush, blueberry cookies, uh, banana drink, Slimer, Harlequin, Wedding Crasher, you could bookmark these. And then as you go and find them in the, uh, in the world and you try them and you journal them, you can keep track of what that chemistry looked like and uh, sort of compare it to uh, what your experience was like, kind of better track what, uh, what you've tried, what you're interested in trying and what makes it all very divergent from each other's chemistries. So um, definitely get on to connect. It's really easy. It's free. Connect.confidentcannabis.com. Uh, play. 
uh, start bookmarking some strings that look interesting, go find them, journal, figure out how it makes you feel, and you should be able to unlock a lot of these secrets that seem hard to figure out when it comes to what cannabis to buy and what to expect from it. So yeah, hope that helps. Thanks.